the period resistive question is pressed in the graph will look like this. If you have n type silicon right here, you see this is one zero zero direction. And uh, the largest period resistive question is going to be longitudinal period resistive question pi L along the one zero zero direction. So you stretch along the one zero zero direction and measure the resistance along the one zero zero direction at the same time. And the value will be uh, 128 something minus. So this is minus. And uh, the, the transverse value is about the half of this value. And that shows up in your table. Okay. If you have p-type wafer right here, again, this is one zero zero direction. And uh, these are zero one zero and zero one bar zero direction, respectively. And you see that, uh, you know, opposite to n-type silicon, p-type silicon almost show nothing, no uh, period resistive correction along the one zero zero or zero one zero direction. Okay. Instead, they show very strong value along the one one zero direction. So this will be one one zero direction, and uh, this will be one one bar zero direction. Okay. So if you take a look at 110 direction, the longitudinal correction will be negative, okay? And uh, the value will be around 60, 70, sorry. And uh, if you take a look at uh, transverse period resistive correction, this really means that, you know, you stretch along the uh, one one bar zero direction and measure the current in one one zero direction. So the measurement and the stretching is ninety degrees apart. Okay, in that case you have positive period resistive correction, and the absolute value is about the same. It's going to be seventy. Okay, so uh, last time we saw that how we can use this fact to design the pressure sensor. Okay, so for here you have a p-type silicon vapor and create the membrane, exaggerated, right? A lot. Small membrane. And then the, you use the uh, longitudinal field resistive which is going to be positive, okay? And uh, uh, transfers to field resistive which will be negative here. So the way you, uh, you connect them uh, together electrically will be to construct the uh, uh, wisdom bridge. So this way you can construct the wisdom bridge and supply the current here along one uh, you know, pair of connection and measure the, uh, the current or the voltage across the other pair of connection here in the middle. Okay, so that's the way how we can measure it, and uh, it's a simple uh, representation of this pressure sensor. In reality, uh, in commercial market, uh, they try to minimize the use of uh, repeated pattern, you know, because, you know, it's a cost, basically. So if you can achieve uh, the goal without using uh, complicated uh, connection or circuitry, that's better. So Motorola came up with the pressure sensor long time ago, very long time ago already. So they renewed uh, their technology and updated their fabrication technology as well. And they just simply used a single pressure the, the resistance right here. So look, this is called x user and uh, they use anti-silicon because in anti-silicon you know the pi t can be used here and the uh, pi t transfers the uh, period of resistive correction 50 you know. and uh, the current is going to be uh, 
measured here. So sorry. So in this case, the stress will be along this direction. Okay, one one general direction, and the current. So sorry, the stress will be along one one general direction, right? Yeah, and the current will be uh, stress and current. They are 90 degrees apart. So that's why we are using pi t in this case. Okay, x user right here, and they. Uh, 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 position the location the position the uh, the sensor pattern very close to the edge okay so you have an external voltage and then measurement all right uh, they use the both uh, bonded wafer so top wafer and uh, bottom wafer has been bonded together and there's a hole here and diaphragm it's right here. Diaphragm is pretty thick at the time, but it's getting thinner and thinner nowadays as technology progressed, you know, and uh, the, the whole thing became much better. So they came up with nowadays uh, pressure sensor and the barometer all together. So this is indeed the uh, technical spec uh, data sheet of the uh, barometer pressure sensor they use alternator or barometer applications so we can use this pressure sensor and barometer indeed and the uh, integrated silicon pressure sensor and on chip signal uh, condition which means that you know all our electronics parts are actually uh, packaged together and temperature is compensated and calibrated okay and that's very simple to feel. you can purchase from the web nowadays Let us discuss some issues regarding the use of piezo resistance. First of all, uh, what will be the proper doping level? And there's an interesting fact about this doping. Uh, if there's no doping, you have neither n-type silicon nor p-type silicon. It's just a pure silicon, which is a semiconductor and uh, it will hardly conduct the current and you cannot use it for the sensor of course and uh, if doping level is too much what's happening is there are too much uh, too many uh, current carriers for example electrons or the holes there are too many and the whole behavior of this highly doped silicon will become much more like a metal what was the metal in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the piezo resistance? Well, it doesn't have any material change when uh, the stress is applied, right? So you only rely on the geometry change in order to measure stress. That was the uh, uh, strain gauge, right? So if you have too much doping, then you're going to be ended up with uh, silicon behaving like metal. So that's right here. Now. So this is the doping level. You see, uh, 10 to the 16th power. You have this uh, material with you. Yeah, I'm going to put it on the web. Uh, ETL, 10 to the 17th power per cc. Okay. And uh, 10 to the 18th power, 19th and 20th. Okay. As you and this is a temperature, okay. So zero degrees Celsius plus minus twenty five degrees Celsius minus fifty minus seventy five twenty five degrees Celsius right here. So that is the uh, standard. Kind of like it. This curve is twenty five. Okay, and uh, as you. Uh, 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 have more standard doping, right? Yeah, 10 to the 16th power, low doping. I will, I will say uh, medium doping, okay? Not too low, but medium doping. Then uh, your uh, reference value, you know, we say that that's the uh, pH of description of uh, 50, for example, and uh, we'll consider it as is a resistive question of one. Okay. However, if you increase the doping level, 
10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. Right here. Doping level. As it increases, the effective daily resistive question becomes decreased. So now here, at about 1,000 times, compared with the normal doping, medium doping level, the pH of resistance question will become half. Okay? And if you increase more, like 10,000 times, that will become very, very low. It's a fraction of it, 10%, 20% of the standard pH of resistive question. It diminishes very quickly at higher doping level. So that's one thing we can learn. When you dope, uh, there are some stable doping range between 10 to the 16th power per cc of atoms up to 10 to the 18th power per cc of atoms. They can actually uh, maintain quite a large amount of uh, standard value of the uh, pH of resistive coefficient. That's one thing. And second thing is, if you take a look at the other graphs right here, as temperature fluctuates, this value, pH description, changes a lot. And that's very, very significant change indeed. Okay? Look at this. Uh, if the temperature becomes freezing temperature 0 degrees Celsius, the pH description will increase up about 20%. And that's huge. If you uh, uh, increase the temperature up to 50 degrees Celsius, if you go to the uh, desert, okay? Sorry, if you go to desert, okay? if you go to the desert, then pH coefficient will diminish by about 10%. So all these values, starting from 25 up to minus 75, down to 100, 125 fluctuates a lot. So there's a very strong temperature dependence and that's uh, negative in it. As you increase the temperature, pH of resist question will become diminished. As you decrease the temperature, it becomes uh, larger. Okay, minus basically. And such kind of uh, uh, negative dependence on the temperature uh, of the pH of resist question it's shown up here, for example, here. Okay? As you increase the temperature, pH of resist correction will drop down. Alright? And that's very important because uh, you can even use this kind of phenomena to measure the temperature indeed. And uh, this temperature dependence is stronger than that of the metal. So if you have a good way of tuning this TCL, temperature correction of resistance, in other words, the resistance depending upon the temperature. Not only the, the stress, but temperature. So let's say uh, you, you, you leave the stress constant, okay? You don't do anything about the stress, but just use this pH resistance correction to measure the uh, resistance change. Of course, it is related with the resistance change related with the uh, temperature, then it's a very good temperature sensor. People already came up with this semiconductor temperature sensor. It's uh, uh, you know, very well used in the commercial uh, uh, area nowadays. It's no wonder. Okay. And uh, when you design this pH of risk question, uh, you also need to consider the uh, power consumption because you will uh, you know, use the current measure the voltage and uh, to measure the resistance change right so as soon as the current is flowing through this little element you know that it will produce the heat and uh, as it is heated the characteristic will change at the same time you know every other part of the electronics will be affected as well and that's a very important consideration you need to think about on top of that as temperature increases, there's a very important phenomenon that comes into our picture. That is the uh, noise. And we call such phenomenon thermal noise or Johnson noise right here.
what is normal noise, what is Johnson noise, uh, we'll have a better chance to cover this in the other lecture. But uh, just understand that uh, there are a couple of things to consider. Open level, to maintain a stable range of head resistance, temperature, to avoid the temperature you need to do a lot of compensation schemes and uh, power consumption. You need to think about how much power your resistor will consume and noise. You want to uh, measure uh, signal as small as possible, right? To measure small change of elevation in the barometer application, for example. Okay. There are also other things to consider, uh, diffusion profile. For example, if you have a beam cantilever or membrane like this, and along the edge, you will install, this, uh, you will uh, have a pattern of this period of resistance. This is the best case, you know. Why? Because if there's the, uh, uh, for example, in this beam, bending moment, and uh, maximum stress will occur at the surface. You see uh, this stress distribution. This is the uh, uh, neutral axis where there's no stress and there's the uh, 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 positive stress and positive stress at the top, uh, negative stress at the bottom. Uh, tension and compression. As you make this guy bend this way, okay? So this is a good way of, uh, 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 you know, uh, having your phase of resistive pattern. But this is too ideal, you know. You, you cannot really uh, have your pattern right at the surface. Rather than that, after some temperature process, uh, they will diffuse. And uh, after ion implantation, for example, you are already in the body of the silicon, and then as temperature increases, as, as you apply uh, this uh, thermal annealing process, this distribution will become uh, broadened. Broadened. It, uh, you're going to be ended up like this. And the total response of this distribution will be a weighted uh, uh, combination of all these uh, contrib little contributions. So this is okay, you still have some stress value that can be sensed. However, uh, if your doping is too deep and uh, it became broadened like this, just happened to be along the center, what kind of signal are you going to have? There's the uh, positive contribution by the uh, piezo resistive friction, whatever it is, positive or negative positive contribution. And there's the uh, negative contribution, whatever it is, the value is positive or negative. Negative contribution, negative to this contribution. Okay, opposite of this contribution. So, positive contribution and negative contribution, they will cancel each other, and there's a big problem. Okay, you have zero signal basically. Theoretically, this is the worst case. So when you uh, design the uh, doping, you need to consider seriously, you need to seriously consider this doping profile. Okay? You can also use uh, polysilicon. Polysilicon is also a uh, crystal silicon, but it's a polycrystalline silicon. So their orientation is more or less random. Uh, crystal orientation of each grain is more or less random. So uh, their uh, pH resist corruption tends to cancel depending upon their orientation. However, you can still have the remaining pH resist corruption and that value is substantial. Gauge factor, in terms of gauge factor, it will be around 30. And that's pretty good compared with the metal. Metal is only one or two, you know. So it's uh, uh, at least one order of magnitude bigger than the metal. And you have a freedom of using polysilicon, unlike silicon. Single crystal silicon, you need to have the whole body made of single crystal, which is pretty difficult. 
you know how it is difficult to create the membrane you know how it is difficult to create the uh, uh, the, the, the cantilever structures made of single crystal silicon however uh, if you uh, create for example a, a thin uh, silicon nitride membrane that's gonna be easy you know membrane nitride will survive in the uh, potassium hydroxide etching leaving very very thin layer something like uh, you know submicron thin something like 0.5 microns 0.2 microns you know and on top of that you can pattern polysilicon and you can use polysilicon as piezo resistance with gauge factor of 30 wouldn't that be nice so that's going to be isotropic piezo resistive effect indeed uh, people try such and you see that this is non-silicon thin film, like silicon nitride oxide. And on top of that, right at the surface, you can pattern this polysilicon piezo resistor. And uh, you go through an aging process because polysilicon will have the uh, embedded uh, 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 the stress, built-in stress. So by the annealing, you can relieve the stress and uh, crystal can be grown larger. As you have larger crystal in the domain, you have larger piezo resistive effect. Okay? And dopant will distribute more or less equally within this uh, pattern, the thickness of polysilicon uh, piezo resistor. So you see that this is silicon dioxide and the polysilicon is on top of it. So you can use piezo resistance phenomena of this Polysilicon. Is there any uh, commercial application? Yes, there is. The uh, Philips uh, pressure sensor is made of these polysilicon patterns. You know, sometimes patterns like this. You see, uh, they have the uh, 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 freedom in designing the shape of thin membrane because you know, they have free of freedom of choice uh, of the uh, uh, these membrane materials. They can either create circular membrane or a rectangular membrane, square membrane here, yeah. and uh, uh, place the uh, polysilicon registers like this along the four corners. This is exaggerated again, you know. And the uh, piezo polysilicon piezo registers are here, four of them to amplify the whole effect. And uh, you can have a silk cavity very easily, unlike uh, a single crystal silicon. So the polysilicon uh, plate can be directly used for this application. So this membrane itself is polysilicon. And uh, on top of that, the piezo resistance of polysilicon as well. Polysilicon, polysilicon combination. Would that be nice? Right. Okay, let me uh, finish up here regarding piezo resistors and the use of piezo resistors particularly for uh, the uh, pressure sensor applications and then let me move on to move on to the next topic digital light processing You guys probably heard about digital light processing. When you go to the uh, cinema, uh, sometimes you can watch uh, the digital cinema, right? The recording of the movie itself was done by a digital process, not the film anymore. And the projection in the cinema is used, uh, you know, is uh, enabled by using this uh, digital lighting uh, digital light processing projector and it's called uh, the digital lighting processing technology and at the heart of it the engine is called digital mirror device okay digital mirror device together with the controlling electronics and software the whole thing is called digital light processing you're gonna learn operating principles Okay, I'm going to explain it and there are dynamics in mirror 
which needs to be seriously considered. I'm going to quickly go over it. This class is not about uh, learning all these details of the uh, physics and design process. Rather than that, we're going to uh, 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 focus more about the fabrication process. Okay. And I also discuss the reliability and optical optics design in some system electronics very quickly. Okay, very quickly. There's a brief history about this development of a digital light processor. Uh, the whole thing, you know, the company who actually developed this technology is Texas Instruments. No wonder the, uh, the company that uh, developed the first uh, integrated circuit by uh, Jack Kelly, who got the Nobel Prize in 2000. It is Texas Instruments. And uh, at first, uh, they call this device not digital mirror device, but they call it deformable mirror device. Inter interesting, isn't it? Deformable mirror device. Because they deform a thin membrane and cause this optics interference phenomena. So the whole thing looks like this. This is kind of shiny surface whatever it is, polymer, metal, uh, crystal, silicon, whatever it is, and somehow apply the force here, make this uh, surface depressed a little bit. And that depression will cause light interference. How much depression is needed? A quarter of a light uh, uh, wavelength is enough to create the uh, destructive interference so that this spot becomes originally uh, shiny but this spot becomes dark so you can make this spot shiny bright dark bright dark by letting this uh, uh, membrane uh, deform or just a little bit so initially they tested a lot of different combinations first one was just the elastomer and then apply the voltage to make this elastomer deform. They thought that it was the most stable way of doing uh, such business. But it turns out that it's very hard to uh, create a reliable deformation of this elastomer. And second idea was to have the membrane. Again, it's a membrane here. And apply the electric field by applying the voltage here. Let this deform. It worked and it created optical sensation and at this moment actually uh, Sony uh, 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 used this idea a lot and came up with the uh, light belt gating technology which uh, has been recently uh, commercialized but it didn't go too long and they, they don't uh, uh, supply the commercial product anymore. PI is the winner. They use some large deformation of this uh, cantilever at first and then torsion beam later by electrostatic operation you see that this is the uh, uh, the mirror so at this moment up to this point people call it deformable mirror but at this moment at this moment people started calling it uh, digital mirror and took quite a few years, six years. You can see that how much investment uh, Texas Instrument is trying. The first year they uh, developed, they announced the, uh, their first uh, uh, deformable meter device was 1983. Okay, that's almost 40 years ago. And uh, the second version, digital meter, came out six years later. So yet, the, uh, the commercial uh, process was too far away. Still, a Texas Instrument, uh, you know, keep investment, kept investment until everything became commercial, like fully commercialized in mid 90s. So it took another six, seven years until everything becomes uh, totally commercialized. And uh, even in mid 90s, the uh, market share was too small in projects project market compared with LCD 
you know, the TV set is quite dominant with LCD, but uh, you can uh, see that in projection market, LCD is not a good player. You, you can see that very soon. I, I'm going to explain that. So at this moment, uh, they started calling this device digital needle device, DMD, same uh, 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 name, DMD, but mirror looks like this. Somehow you have a pattern of mirror like this with the torsion beam, and mirror will tilt. So uh, by tilting the mirror, uh, uh, they rely on totally different uh, 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 way of steer, way of controlling the light, rather than using interference, they use steering, light steering. So you have a light ray falling on the surface, illuminated, and if you steer, if you tilt it, light will go to the other direction. Okay, and this tilt is actually digital, which means that you can see either light, hundred percent of it or if it tilts, light is out of your, 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 your sight, zero, black, basically. So this spot uh, either become uh, totally bright or totally, totally black, bright, dark, bright and dark, zero, one, zero, one. That's why people call this digital mirror. Okay? And there are a number of ways creating this tilting sensation. You can see that this kind of a tilting is possible. They use the uh, octagon shape. They use beam shape. Uh, you can see that how many cases they tested the simple single beam, four beams in a different way. At this time, uh, all other players like uh, Sony, even Samsung, and even Dell Electronics at the time uh, came to play to develop this kind of things. So there was, there was a race started you know, during this process. You can read their paper and uh, a lot of interesting stories. So nowadays, the first product, commercial product, was released in 1996. And uh, even nowadays, probably the biggest market is digital cinema, the high quality. You know, huge screen, large screen cinema is governed by this uh, digital mirror device projector nowadays. There's no other technology that can uh, uh, challenge the TI's technology nowadays. TI is a single vendor in projection market in terms of uh, digital mirror device. Amazing, isn't it? Right? And sometimes they came up with HDTV. And you see that the uh, LG projector TVs nowadays, uh, some of them actually use uh, DLP technology. And business project, why business projectors? Because uh, small projector, they are extremely small, as small as your mobile phone, compact, bright, high contrast, high resolution, and a lot of other things. And uh, uh, one technology that challenges this DLP in small projector market is single mirror. And uh, I can talk about single mirror technology not later on, but yet the dominant technology is digital mirror device technology. So if you go to the cinema nowadays, they use this high performance projection device, projection uh, model. And small projectors, I would say more than 70, maybe 80, 90% of the whole market is DLP nowadays. And uh, uh, other than this projection, there are a lot of other applications, the scientific devices and uh, microscopic uh, 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 projection um, test devices. And people even use uh, uh, optoporate and uh, focus the pattern on the optoporate by using this uh, UV steering. You can cure this fluid while they are flowing into many different shapes, into many different characteristics and use them for biological sensing and uh, biological assembly and many other applications as well. Uh, uh, some lectures ago, I probably have sent you the paper 
uh, that actually shows how you can use optofluid and uh, digital mirror device to come up with a pretty complicated combination of self-assembled uh, microfluidic device. Uh, I'm gonna send the, 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 the same pic, same uh, uh, the paper again. So DMD pro products, these are their characteristics and uh, compare, com comparison with other technologies. What are the existing or uh, the, the ones that people use in terms of display technique? The first one is CRT, you know that, cathode ray tube, right? You can, you can use the electrons, phosphorus screen, and then you can have uh, image optical sensation. CRT, cathode ray tube. And then nowadays people come up with LCD, liquid crystal display. Liquid crystal that actually blocks the light or opens from the back side. Okay, from the back side. This is important. Light comes from the back side. So if you take a look at just uh, liquid display, opening and closing, uh, it has a very nice and uh, bright contrast in it. However, if you display it, well, you need to go through this screen of gate and then display all together and you lose a lot of light. So uh, you lose a lot of brightness. That's why in projection uh, uh, area, LCD is not going to be a good uh, candidate. Electron beam, well, you can, you can uh, sign the electron beam and use it, but uh, it's not for commercial displays for uh, some uh, experimental uh, approaches. And there's also liquid crystal light help, which is similar to LCD, a little different. Let's take a look at the limitations of uh, the current technologies. They are not su suitable for high brightness application, basically. This is very difficult to show uh, completely bright and completely dark patterns. It's your pattern, the brightness, somewhere in the middle, always. The uniformity and stability is a problem. Sometimes, you know, the spot is not very uniform and uh, uh, we use something called form factor so within uh, the element uh, spot element uh, uh, resolution you know element bit element area how much of such area is uh, optically controllable that's called a form factor okay element pixel you know and then pixel needs to be as bright as possible, as dark as possible. And large contrast is needed, and cost is also a problem. Well, in LCD market, in order to increase the brightness and the optical sensation, people started using uh, nanotechnology, okay? And that's gonna be uh, quantum dot TV. And uh, quantum dot TV is popular everywhere. In China, they develop quantum dot TV. Korea, you know, they develop quantum dot TV, in US, Japan, everybody's, uh, uh, you know, interested in quantum dot TV, but that's direct display, not the projection again. Projection quantum dot cannot do anything, but you need to steal the light, that's the deal. And Sony used the gate light belt, the great light belt, sorry, great light belt, as I said, you know, but they don't produce commercial market uh, uh, product anymore, I believe. And uh, TI, uh, as you can hear, the digital light processing technology, and uh, they use digital mirror device, which is basically multi scale fabrication, you know, enabled by multi scale fabrication process. And the engine is called DDE, Digital Display Engine. It is DDE, they sell nowadays. So TI, uh, they don't sell the projector. They sell the heart, the core of this projector, engine, DDE only, all around the world. They are the single vendor. So Sony purchased from TI, Samsung purchased from TI, LG purchased from TI, you know, Chinese company uh, purchased Huawei, purchased from TI as well. And then uh, they use this engine to construct uh, the projectors and uh, experimental devices, scientific devices as well, of uh, high performance. Isn't that amazing, right? So TI is, is the mother of all these things.
you see, uh, it's the only uh, light switch volume in volume production nowadays. Why BMD? Now, there's a, a very impressive uh, uh, performance comparison between LCD and DL DLP. Of course, I'm not talking about the TV, I'm talking about projector. TV, LCD is the king. Okay, there's no wonder. But projector, you know. So if you take a look at this picture, the eyes of a bear, and if you take a look at the detail of it, the left hand side is LCD. The right hand side is DLP, all the same resolution. Same resolution grade. I think it's some kind of grade, right? LCD, VJ grade, VJ. It's, a, it's an old, uh, low resolution. But still, you know, high resolution, the same thing. It's even more difficult for the LCD to realize. You look at this, each pixel has some area that cannot be controlled. If that results in, you know, low, low quality image, basically. And right hand side, you know, each pixel is fully covered with the, uh, the pad. And the uh, DLP can uh, realize this nice pad, actually. So if I take a look at the current right now, the display here, I can take a look at the pixel. And this pixel looks like, uh, I think it's DLP. Because the whole thing is well covered, first of all. I can see each pixel. It's like, a, I think, a millimeter or less. So millimeter or less, uh, this single pixel corresponds to one meter, single meter, eight micron by eight micron in the uh, DDE engine inside, okay? And uh, also, if you take a look at each single meter, you can see something very funny. So single meter will look like this. And at the center, you can see little dark spot. Why is a dark spot? You will find it out very soon. You want to avoid it, you cannot, okay? That is something you need to carry on. However, the next meter, to the single meter, is very closely packed. This is very close to, together. Compared with this, LCD, one pixel and the other, this much of that area exists. Okay? That results in this so-called pixelation. Okay? So by using mechanical display, you can, you can, uh, 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 you know, probably the device has a much better performance in terms of area coverage or form factor. How much form factor is it? I think it's 89%. How much form factor is it? I think it's below 50%. All right? So if you purchase this DDE device, they sell by like these chips. Okay? These are like Intel Cantium chip. Okay? So at first sight, you might think that these are the uh, Intel Cantium chip with uh, one shine meter on the top. Looks like that there's a shine meter on the top. However, you will soon realize that if you take a look at the shine meter on the microscope, there are millions of meters inside and each meter size is 8 micron by 8 micron. What is 8 micron? The size of your red blood cell is 8 microns. So if you place a red blood cell, animal red blood cell right here, it's the same size. Isn't that amazing? Right? Why is it amazing? It has very detailed structure inside underneath this shiny meter. And these structures are much, much smaller in terms of their resolution. Multi-scale, right? Tens of microns, microns, smaller scales. You can put them all together and then function in a way. And furthermore, all these processes are fully commercialized, fully verified, and they are producing maybe millions of these things a year or you know, to sell all around the world.
right? So if you have SVG, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, 500,000 meters. XGA, 786,000 meters. And SXGA, we are talking about 1.3 million meters. 100% are working perfectly for over 95,000 hours perfectly none of them will fail isn't that really amazing right so if you take a look at these digital mirrors you see that there's a little dimple here right that corresponds to this display dark spot now this dark spot is explained because of this, this spot cannot steal the light. Only the other area will steal the light and they will tilt. How do they tilt? They sit on this so called yoke structure. So, this little meter will sit on this yoke structure. Yoke structure will tilt. So, they will tilt this way. Not this way, but this way. Not this way, but this way. Okay? And why do they tilt? Because this, this, these are the electrodes that actually apply electrostatic force on this mirror, which is mostly aluminum. And also this yoke underneath is the same potential. So uh, this guy and uh, the electrode at the bottom will apply electric field to this yoke as well. Electric field to the yoke, electric field to the uh, top uh, shiny meter aluminum all together because of electric field, there's electric field, there will be electrostatic force that will make this whole thing tilt. And what is the spring? Torsional spring is right here. We call this, uh, what is it called? Spring, okay, spring structure. Well, we call this hinge actually. So if you look at their schematic, it will look like this. The mirror is here. The mirror is connected to the yoke by this long and thin uh, uh, metal dipole structure. And uh, this yoke and mirror all together will tilt by this yellow round electrode, you know, so that uh, they will tilt and uh, they will tilt the uh, light by plus minus 10 degrees. And plus minus 10 degrees is enough to steer the light into the optical path and out of the optical path. This is this is the uh, tip of a pin, and uh, it should be very sharp to our eyes. But look how blunt it is. It really looks blunt compared with this eight micron mirror structures. Amazing, amazing, right? And more than anything else, I would like to emphasize that they have. This little tip, which is shown as red uh, thick you know, color, and that part corresponds to this little tip. And these little tips are very, very important in terms of function. Okay, two things. They actually uh, 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 let this guy touch first before any other body touches the, uh, the, uh, the uh, opposing electrode. The opposing electrode will have a ground and uh, this guy will have certain voltage and if they uh, uh, touch each other they will break down okay you lose your device but because of this guy you can avoid it this guy will actually uh, separate this guy from touching this guy uh, you know and uh, second uh, function is more amazing i'm going to talk about it you know in the next slide next slide Basically, uh, uh, what they do is they steer the light. And uh, initially, initially, uh, if you leave your mirror at zero degree, light will come into the picture. Okay? Uh, but the thing is, as soon so light is going to be illuminated from this way. How is it possible? Well, there's a light source. 
light source and the lens that carries this ray of illumination here, ray of illumination, ray of illumination. Okay. And initially, if you just leave your mirror like this, well, the light will be reflected by the same angle of entry. And the angle of entry is 20 degrees by design. So angle of reflection will be 20 degrees as well. And this is kind of a, 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 a ambiguous. Why is it ambiguous? Because light might be close to the projection lens. So it looks probably, it'll look like a gray color. You don't want that to happen. So you know what happens? As soon as you turn your projector, the whole mirror will tilt by 10 degrees without any command. So that's the first sequence. You know what happens now? The angle here will be doubled. So light comes here. So there's no way this light can actually go through your projection lens. Result is total darkness. Okay? So as soon as you turn on your projector, well, the whole uh, background will remain complete darkness. I say complete darkness because there's no light coming in. Okay? The light, whatever that comes in, will be uh, reflected out of this optical path so there's complete darkness okay and then what happens is that you know this is this digital mirror you let one of the mirror tilt by 10 degrees plus 10 degrees what happens this light the the, the optical uh, angle will become zero in terms of this angle so light exactly comes into the, uh, the central axis of optical lens. So let there be light right here. So there's a single spot that's, that becomes shining by the tilt of this mirror. You know what I'm saying. That's why this is 0, 1, 0, 1 digital mirror. But do you really leave uh, this zero and one state, uh, uh, you know, for for constant time, for 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 long time? Not really. They actually uh, move this mirror at very very high speed, so that they can do something called PWM, pulse width modulation. You see that? You know? By doing this pulse width modulation. Uh, you can control the total amount of light that is actually uh, uh, going through this optical path that comes into the eye and that speed is uh, real fast so that your eye cannot even notice it okay your eye can notice 30 frames per second so, so frames per second becomes more than 30 your eyes uh, just will uh, 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 think your brain will think everything as a mixture of all this display okay so remember initially the angle will be tilted by minus 10 degrees by default total black when whenever this light angle becomes plus 10 degrees there we go you have a spot of uh, bright light okay so that's why we have high efficiency in overall contrast ratio brightness if it's dark, it's total dark. If it's real dark, if it's bright, it's total brightness. It's really bright. That's why you can achieve uh, 1,000 before. Nowadays, 1 10,000 of uh, uh, contrast ratio, which is impossible with LCD. Because LCD uses a film, and then light comes through the film. So total darkness is not, is not really total darkness. You see some... some, some uh, 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 you know, uh, dimming uh, uh, brightness uh, across this screen, even though it's total darkness, it should be total darkness. Okay? Even though it's total brightness, light comes through the film, and then the amount of light that comes through the film uh, uh, will be lost. 
into your eye. That's why people use quantum, quantum dot to amplify this light nowadays to make the whole thing brighter. Okay, but in terms of projection, you cannot do that. So look, this is total darkness. Okay? And I see nothing, almost nothing. But if you use, for example, LCD, you can still see something coming out of this uh, 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 screen. That's total difference. difference. I see nothing. And how can you uh, 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 realize the grayscale color operation? Well, that's going to be a PWM, pulse width modulation. Well, nowadays they use 8 bit, even 16 bit modulation, but just to make uh, a, 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 you know, analysis, understanding simple, let's say we do 4 bit modulation. The sequence will come like this. For instance, one 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 one. That really means that you have to you have to turn on all the time. On 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 on. That's the meaning of it. So the result is result is one 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 is coming here. Okay. What is 1111? It's bright spot right here. So that's the uh, cycle, predetermined cycle of this pulse, and they keep turned on over the almost the whole cycle. Of course, there's some dead time like this, but it's almost on, 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 right? And uh, you divide the whole cycle into so in this case 4 1 16 16 uh, uh, division 16 so you can change this width uh, up to 16 times okay the full is 16 and uh, the minimum will be 1 from 1 to 16. Okay, so minimum is here, 1. Okay, 0, 0, 0, 0 is like this. Okay, you cannot really avoid this small change. But that's negligible. Okay, so your pulse width will start from single digit up to 16 digit. And then this pulse will repeat. Okay, so your mirror in this case will be turned on for a little bit and then come back and the result will be dark because this whole thing is operating much faster than your eye can actually recognize more than 30 frames per second right why is that possible because you use a micro scale mechanism and that's very important okay and uh, in this case, full turn on, you turn on more than up, more than up, more than up, more than up. And the whole thing becomes faster than the uh, 30 frames per second, right? Then your eye cannot recognize again, okay? In between, yes, you have 16 choices. This is the uh, combination of uh, binary numbers, 4-bit. 2 to the 4th uh, power, 16, you have 16 choices. So your color path will become 16. From total brightness to total darkness, there are 16 grade. And if you have an 8-bit PWM, 2 to the 8th power, 256 grade. And if you have the 16-bit, uh, 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 well, that's amazing, that's 65536, right? 65,000 something, you know, that, that, that. Well, how can you uh, 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 realize a color? You use three uh, 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 basic lights, RGB, red, green, and blue. And each of these light has their own depth, 256, for example, if you use 8-bit 
PWM on red, 8-bit PWM on blue, 8-bit PWM pulse width modulation on green, RGB. By mixing this color, you can realize any color as possible by the uh, ratio of mixture. So 8-bit, uh, 8-bit, 8-bit. Total is 2 to the 24th power. That corresponds to, I believe, uh, 65536. And uh, recently, this became much better. 10 bit each, total 30 bit. This is going to be 2 to the 30 power. It's going to be billion color. Billion color, basically. Right? 2 to the 30 is billion, you know, because 2 to the 10th uh, 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 power is 1000. 1000 to the 1000 uh, uh, power is billion. That's two to the power, billion color. And this is amazing, right? You can realize billion color with this operation of PWM. So this is how that works. You know how you can uh, mix the color. You have a light source here going through this lens focus on the uh, mirrors remember that and the mirrors was originally tilted by minus 10 degrees but for optical sensation they were tilted by plus 10 degrees how we're going to explain that and uh, during that time this color will will rotate r g b red green blue red green blue so when this red portion is moving you will try red PWM. When this green portion is moving in, you try the green PWM and then blue PWM. And the color will be rotating at 60, sorry, 90 uh, hertz, 90 times a second. So each second, uh, there are 30 frames of each color. Can your eye recognize such change? No. Your brain will just think about the whole thing as a mixture of the whole thing, mixture of all things. You guys probably remember the conspiracy theory, right? Uh, you know, the, the bad guy, dictator, will put his uh, picture inside the, uh, the frames of commotion so that people can recognize his face, people can become familiar with his face. Even though uh, uh, in real time they don't really recognize their signal will remain in their brain. That's the conspiracy theory, and that is psychologically, psychologically proven. Actually, okay, you can really do that. You can embed such kind of a sensation into brain, uh, even uh, uh, without noticing it. Right? Things like that. So, uh, well, and then uh, everything's mixed together and then projected here. So this screen currently, as of now, is actually uh, changing the color, RGB, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. It's just that your eyes cannot recognize it. Isn't that amazing, right? So that is controlled by this whole process. TI is selling this uh, brain, this, this DDE. And uh, 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 Samsung, for example, purchased this DDE and they construct optics around it. All right, and if you go to the cinema, well, this is not a uh, high brightness because you need to go through the filter. What was the problem with LCD? You need to go through the film, the filter, right? So you don't want to use the filter. What can you do? You use three different chips: one chip for the uh, green color, the other chip for the red, the other for the blue. Okay, and then you just mix them together. This time you don't need any color wheel, you don't need any such kind of film. So your brightness will become much better. As a consequence, people can uh, view this inside the, uh, the cinema with uh, uh, you know, amazing brightness. As a consequence, this whole thing, this projector becomes expensive, of course, much, much more expensive than 
are the home use, much more expensive than your business use, actually. Okay, isn't that amazing? And uh, from now on, uh, I can explain the detailed operation. Uh, we need to understand the detailed operation because uh, 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 in order to design proper uh, uh, fabrication process, you need to understand the operation. So uh, I'm going to explain this next uh, week. And uh, have a good weekend. We'll see you next week.